All right, I want to take a moment to welcome Matt Marr to the show. Now, Matt's an interesting guy. He has been in, well, the thing that really stuck out to me, yes, he's a clinical psychologist, so he definitely has a reason for being on the podcast, but he's kind of famous in the fact that he's met Justin Timberlake. He's been in so many commercials that I guarantee you've seen. Um, Welcome to the show, Matt. Hey, Chris. How are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't you tell, let's get let's get the commercial thing out of the way, because this is probably the most fascinating thing. When I was looking through your reel, you had a Jim Parsons commercial where, you know, it was like the he's running and there's the what the laptop thing. Um, oh, the, uh, yeah, the Intel commercial. The, I think out of the entire reel, the thing that cracked me up the most was the pirate one, the eye, the eye patch one. That was my favorite commercial I've ever done. And it <laughs> so only funny to give your listeners context. It was, you know, it was the state of Washington or Wyoming was state of Wyoming was giving away free nicotine patches to help people stop smoking. So they have this like commercial of this guy, um, kind of st- uh, this guy, me like standing next to a pirate on a street corner and then stealing the patch off of his, uh, his eye and like running into the voiceover says like free patches. Right. Um, it was my first – it was actually my first com- – no, my second commercial that I ever shot. And um, it was in downtown L.A. And I, I was just so stoked to do it. And then uh, it was – and the guy who was the play the pirate really was grumpy. And he had to wear like this wooden leg and like put his knee on. That and was, like, was the funniest thing. When, when yep, yeah. you go running and then you just got this pirate with this wooden leg chasing you. I mean that, that's, that was the point where I was just like – this is hilarious. You know? it, was, it was my favorite. I think probably one of my favorite spots I did. And it's so funny that hardly anybody's seen it because it only aired in the state of Wyoming. Uh, so my mom showed it, put it on her Facebook and her friend called her and she said, oh my gosh, <laughs> they play that commercial all the time here. And I'm like, so apparently if I went to Wyoming, you'd be, you'd be a superstar, yeah, right? You'd be the, the guy who stole the pirate patch. Pretty much. Pretty and much. the other, the other one, so there's a couple more I have to talk about before we actually sure. get down to business. Um, the other one that really cracked me up was the gay one where you're about to get married. And then this woman oh, who you clearly have these preconceived notions about like, oh, how dare you ruin the sanctity of marriage and everything. But it's just like the stain on your shirt. That was a funny one too, I thought. Oh, thank you. That that was actually a spec commercial, meaning – uh, it wasn't a real commercial. It was for a director who – so what a lot of people do is they – directors will invest their own time and a lot of money making these commercials that look like legit commercials. And so that way they can get agencies to pick them up and they get work. And the woman actually who played the church lady in that, uh, Lynn Stewart, she actually is a, an original groundling. She was on Pee Wee's Playhouse as Miss um, Miss Patty, I believe, was the character. Wow. Um so that was cool. And we that commercial, that was the first thing I've ever done that became a viral thing because we filmed that commercial and um, we filmed it, I think, in – we filmed it in June and then like two weeks later, the Supreme Court ruled gay marriage for the country. And then like two weeks after that, Kim Davis kind of blew up as a political newsworthy person. We didn't even plan it that way. Man, and then it's it was a like, perfect he, storm of this. Yeah, this, exactly. Right. He just released a commercial, and like in, I think in four days, it had two million views or something like that. Man, that's awesome. People uh, were pissed off at Tide saying, I'm never buying Tide uh, again. Well, you always, like, you always get those people, you know? You no, know, I felt bad. I mean, Tide didn't. Tide, oh, this Tide so, didn't even do it. Yeah, they, did, oh. they did release a statement. They're like, we love parody. And when people, they kind of approved it because they said, we love parody and we love it when people love our products so much they want to. So we think that's great. So they kind of did. But anyway. Well, that's nice. And then finally, the other one, which is, I think, one of your favorite ones is the Justin Timberlake one. Now, from what I got, it looked like it was all planned out. But was this. Be, it, the commercial basically has you like singing from his new album or something, and then it's got him behind you. And I don't think you know he's behind you, or did you know he was behind you? Sugar, we did not know. Like oh. we had, oh, I did. So, did so that time. his eyes are so blue. That was like an an improv okay. moment. Like it was like on the spot. It was just that was truth talk. That was my truth. <laughs> That's like I mean, seriously, I'm looking at your shirt right now. Like, think of that. That is your shirt is really blue. Yeah. Justin Timberlake's eyes are even bluer than that. Like, you actually have really pretty blue eyes as well. 
But Justin Timberlake's eyes are like the bluest thing. Different level. So then there's Chris and then there's JT. And JT's through the roof. It's not that far, but it's just right under there, buddy. (laughs) Give yourself some credit. But yeah, it was – he – that was – we were all – when you did that, that's the audition that got me into the Screen Actors Guild that got me in the union because we just – the audition was – it, they were actors, people that were, for the most part, because that's how they cast it. But they cast it as my agent called me, or he sent an email to all of us saying, hey, who's a Justin Timberlake fan? And I emailed him back immediately and was like, ah! <laughs> and so that's who got cast. So it really was true fans. And um, it was great because the way they surprised people, they did it in kind of sections. And my group was the first group. And then they had to set up the shot. So what was the coolest part is that we just – I just got to hung out, hang out with Justin Timberlake for about three hours Man. and just talk to him about life and his music and kind of – and he was so interested in what was going on in my life. I mean it was literally – I felt like we should have had a red Solo cup with beer in it and been at a barbecue. It was just so chill. He was the nicest guy. He was so kind. And even – one thing I would say about that commercial is just kind of the person he was is that – so at the end of the commercial, there's a shot of everybody. And he requested that shot. I heard him say it to the producer. He said, no, I want to get – because they weren't going to shoot that shot. And he's like, no, I want to shoot this shot so that way everybody gets a residual. And he did that because that's the way SAG works. Like oh. if, if, I, if your not, face isn't shown in the commercial, then you don't get a residual every time. They care. You just get paid for the day. So that's the difference wow. of like you know $600 of like – twelve thousand dollars and he wanted to make sure everybody was in that commercial so Man, they got what that. a nice thing and not I everyone know. would do that because clearly the whoever's setting it up does not want to pay you that no money no. <clears throat> but yeah i can't say no to justin timberlake i know i just <laughs> i love him i love him love him such a sweetheart <laughs> all right so i think we've gone off topic enough let's now get on topic days, so i'll do it so be careful with me <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> All right, so clinical psychology. Tell me a little bit about your background, how you came about wanting to maybe – you said you have a master's degree in clinical Mm -hmm. psychology. So Mm -hmm. how did you go maybe from the clinical psychology realm to acting? So a lot of it was – so my undergrad is in opera performance. I'd say University of North Texas where you said your brother goes. So um, And so I did my undergrad in music years ago. And then I moved out to California. Um, well, I was, well, was going to go to Chicago and New York and do all that. And then this is a longer story sh- uh, that I'll make short. But uh, I'm very lucky that my two musical idols are Shania Twain and Justin Timberlake. And I've been able to like meet them both. Um, and with Shania Twain, like I, she called me up on a con- at a concert in Oklahoma City. And I got to sing. She asked me to sing a song with her, and it wow. was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> it was great. It was life changing. But then that, I told that story like, because I was like, this is back in the day where you like go to a Yahoo like web fan page, like the Shania uh, fan page. Yeah, okay, yeah. And somebody said, oh, they're looking for people to do this show, and I emailed this producer. Long story short, I got this television gig from Country Music Television, where they flew me to Shania Twain's hometown in Canada, and they filmed me like interviewing her teacher and where she worked. And it was hosting. It was hosting in front of a camera. And I was just about to move to Chicago and then hopefully New York and pursue more theater. And doing that, it reminded me that what I've always really loved more than acting and performing are, I was a, as a kid, I was obsessed with talk shows and things like that, that I love what we do in podcasting. I love p- interviews, people's stories and that kind of, so that's really what it always is drawing me. So then I moved to California and then kind of was like this country boy for living in L.A. just took me a bit to get settled. <laughs> Didn't really audition a lot. And then um, and then I kind of was just looking for more purpose in my life. And I started volunteering for the Trevor Project, which is a suicide helpline for LGBT youth. And I was a helpline counselor. So people would call in and talk to us when they were feeling suicidal or whatnot. And um, I really liked it. Um, so if you know you like talking to to helping kids that are suicidal, I'm like, okay, then obviously this therapy thing might work. Mm. For me. So that's kind of what led me into my master's. And then I was totally full on getting my master's, going to going to pursue the therapist route and um, solely. And then it's so funny that going through the process, two things happened. Going through the process of getting my master's in therapy. I'd never been in therapy or anything in my life. I realized that the reason I didn't do a lot of things in my life were fear and the fear of failing. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to have this talk show and I was just too scared to do it. 
Um, so the, and be an actor and that kind of started to happen. And then honestly, I had a friend who just said, Oh man, you, I know this person who kind of like does this like hosting commercial class. You should take it just for fun. Like he'll give you a deal, but you've got a really good face for commercials. And then that was it. He like, I took this class and then it just kind of, I did well in the class and he said, you should totally pursue this and get an agent. And then I just kind of thought, well, I'll do it just to get, you know, just for a little extra money. And then now it's really turned in, I mean, it's turned into a career. I mean, you know, my, my health insurance comes from that, you know, from SAG and so things like that. So it's now a part of my life that just kind of blossomed. And um, yeah, I, I, it really has been, I mean, I worked hard for it. I sound like it just happened to me. Yeah. I did. Like once I decided I wanted to commit to it, I was taking commercial classes, you know, and working on my craft and things like that. But and but that's how it got into it. But then I still I have my summer camp for LGBT youth. So that I do the therapist stuff in that. I do coaching for actors and things as far as like getting past nerves and things like that. So I'm still doing therapy stuff too. Yeah, it's a really interesting story. It, I guess I kind of had it wrong. I thought you went the master's clinical psychology route and then stumbled into acting. It was kind of like acting and then the psychology thing and then back to acting so it's interesting but of course i'm interested in your clinical psychology degree because people listening to this podcast are going through breakups now yes. you mentioned to me you had a friend breakup do you want to maybe elaborate on that a little bit so we can sure. we can further relate to the listener here yeah so i was single for a long time like <clears throat> pardon me about almost 15 years. I've been in a relationship now with my boyfriend for, it'll be two years in February. And, um, Congrats. but before, thank you. Um, <laughs> loving my life. And, uh, but yeah, so for about 15 years I was single. And a lot of that is that when I look back, I totally have that codependent personality in me. And I know that. And that's one reason I decided to become a therapist. Cause I said, I need to get paid when people want to dump their shit on me and help me fix the problem. Oh, sorry. I said a cuss word. No, that's sorry. Right. Um, and, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, so I, I kind of try to make it more of a mental switch of, cause I was that person everybody always talked to, but I found I, I gotten like a lot of kind of codependent friendships. That's been a pattern for me and something I've been trying to break. And I think within the last five years, I've been better at that. And this last one was just, a friend, a guy, another gay guy, and um, there was nothing romantic or anything between us. But we just we actually met volunteering for that Trevor Project as mm -hmm. helpline counselor stuff. We became best friends. This group of us, and he was a filmmaker and really interested in filmmaking. Um, and I was, you know, I was interested in doing hosting stuff and stuff like that. And I was at the time working on my therapy stuff. And uh, and doing my master's, but you've got to get a lot of free hours, like three thousand hours for free. You get paid doing therapy, or you don't get paid doing therapy. So I was basically doing that, and he just needed help producing like a short film. And I said, "Okay, sure, I'll help you," just because I had a little bit of extra time. And it kind of started blossoming into like this working relationship. And so we were, I mean, best friends for probably about four years and five years, and. We're in a working relationship for about three of those. And, you know, everything was going fine. But then I realized that not to talk too much about him because I want to respect his privacy. But, um, you know, it was it just it was one of those things where um, our work was so um, it just it was it was ruining the friendship. And, well, and I don't know if it, I don't really know if it was. Actually, when I say that, I don't know if it was ruining the friendship. It's more of when I look back on that friendship, uh, Maya Angelou says that quote. Uh, uh, I'm going to totally mess it up. But there's a quote that basically <laughs> she paraphrases where she says, because I'm not Maya Angelou. But basically that um, people tell you who they are the first time they meet them and believe them. And I think with him, like he told me very upfront the type of person he was. And I don't mean this in a bad way. I just – He's a great guy, but I mean the type of person he was, how he lives his life, how what is his truth, kind of what is authenticity to him and how he wants to react react with people and interact with people. He told me that pretty much within like the first month, but I think there was that part of me that like just like wanted like a best friend and that codependent part of me that was like, oh, it's cool. That's fine, and I kind of compromised a bit of myself, mm -hmm. and he ended up being that friend that during our friendship would always tell me, 
other people are walking on you. Stand up for yourself and blah, blah, blah. And it was really helpful. And then I think what happened is that I started taking his advice, which is great advice so much. I started at times when I felt like I was being walked over by him, I started standing up to him. Mm -hmm. And it really, um, and I'm sure there's more fault on my end too. I I just don't see it because it was me. No, but uh, no, but so it just started to break down the friendship and it just ended, you know, where he told me, he said he wanted, you know, he thought he needed to take a break in the friendship. And I said, but keep working. And I said, well, you know, when we started, before we started working together, I remember saying to him, I said, you know, at any time, if this affects the friendship, I think we both need to agree that, that, the, that the friendship comes first and then we'll pull out of the work stuff because the friendship is way more important. And that's kind of, that's kind so of he, my promise. He prioritized work over the, the friendship yeah. perhaps. And when I said that, when I said that whole thing of we're going to take friendship first, work second, I realized when I look back on it, he never agreed to that and said, yeah, uh, me too. He just kind of nodded his head. And again, it's, I believed what I wanted to hear instead mm-hmm. of what was said in front of me. And cause he never lied to me. He was very authentic about who he was, but I really lied to myself. Yeah. And I, I feel like a lot of people listening to this can definitely relate because they're at this stage in their life where they've just gone through a breakup and the people who come to my <laughs> website, <clears throat> oh, your cough's Sorry. contagious. <laughs> no, no, all good. Sorry, I thought I muted it. Sorry, I didn't know. No. <laughs> well, the people who come to my website, they're kind of at this crossroads where they're trying to decide whether or not to get over their ex mm-hmm. or get their ex back. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it takes that introspective person to really look back and mm-hmm. see things with some perspective a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I'm really kind of interested to get your take since you are a therapist slash clinical psychologist what do you think someone should do generally when they're at this crossroads? Should you ever try to get an ex back or should you just tr- simply try to move on? You know, it's, there's, I have two answers that came to my head, you know, and I'm going to say this cause I feel like people have this, like the ego in me was like, forget them, move mm-hmm. on, be your own person. So there is that part of me that wants to just kind of write people off. Um, and, but then there's that other part of me, like, and that where people make mistakes. And so I think it's about, and one thing that I look back on this with my friend, why I knew it was kind of over is that I remember when he said, you know, I want to just kind of focus on work, actually like at that point kind of putting myself out there that I'm open and willing to have a conversation about this. That's kind of how I said it, left it. It was like, I'm open and willing to have a conversation about this. And then I realized like about like three or four months in, he didn't, he wasn't ever going to talk to me again about that. Mm. And then that was a good thing. I was felt happy that I didn't close the door because I was open to working on it. And I went, oh, he doesn't want to work on this. So this isn't as important to him as it was to me. And that was actually, it made me sad. But in another way, it kind of gave me this freedom of like, you know, kind of that whole adage of they're just not that into you. And he wasn't that into me as a friend as I was to him. So I think for people, I don't think there's, it's a complex thing. And as far as asking an ex back, I think that it's more about, are you, have you broken up? Because there's many reasons you break up, but are you, is it, how are you being treated? Because you can still, I know a lot of people that break up and people are kind to one another. That's a Mm -hmm. huge thing that I say, my own boyfriend and I talk about in our relationships. We always try to be kind to one another. We get mad at each other, we get upset. And I do think that there is, if you're in a breakup right now, and if the person is being malicious, or if they're being vindictive, they're trying to get your goat, Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the person you need to get back together with. But if it's a kind breakup, I think it's more about not getting back together in a relationship, but more about is there anything salvageable as a friendship? Because there are people, and I've been this too, where you have breakups and you're still friends Mm -hmm. because you still have a respect for one another and a kindness for one another. Because I do think more people are good people than more people are jerks. I don't don't know. Did that answer the question at all? Uh, Pretty much really, really well. In fact, it made me think of something because I feel like a lot of the people who come to my website are not going through kind breakups. Um, mm. Some are. Yeah. Obviously, we have a lot of people coming to the website, listening to the podcast that are going through pretty mutual breakups, I would say, but most of the time they're not. 
So can you give me some examples of a breakup maybe that you would try to get back with the person? What would that look like? You know, um, I think that, uh, and a lot of people are probably going to bristle when I say this, but I think a lot of times. Brace yourselves, um, people. I know. <laughs> I think one example potentially of uh, of getting back together are when somebody cheats on somebody else with somebody mm-hmm. else. And I know that seems kind of for a lot of people that's the ultimate sin. Right. Um, that's not to me because I think attraction to other people is – Normal. I'm not one of those people that thinks open relationship. Everybody should be in an open relationship. Mm-hmm. Although that's cool if you want that. I don't want to. I'm not wired yeah. that way. But yeah, I, I get it. I know a lot of people that are um, gay straight, which is shocking to me. I remember thinking, "Wow, a lot of straight people are into this." I no, I no, I can't do it. But <laughs> uh, I think that. But I do know a lot of people that another person has either emotionally or physically cheated on one another, and then they end up having. A lot of times we'll go to a couple therapists for it, but they end up having these conversations about what, why the person cheated. And a lot of times it wasn't even about they were attracted to that other person is that they were feeling, they were feeling either not loved or not attended to or not by the person their relationship with. And what they really want and still want is that, that love and that validation through the person they were with. For so many years. And so the whole, the aspect of cheating was really just, it was a symptom. It was like a cough when you have the flu. It's not really about, it's not really about the sickness. sickness. The cough is just a symptom of that. And if people can kind of wrap their heads around that and actually have a conversation about, well, how did, why did this happen? And what can we do that would, you were looking for closeness and you, looked for it with her or with him and mm. is there something that we could do and repair to bring that type of closeness back and i know several couples uh counseled a few that have gone through this breakup period and then come back and are actually a much stronger couple and even i, I remember one couple client i had where the the man had cheated and came back and then the woman she took him back and they talked about it and they were a client for a while but they came back and i remember a year later she said i'm so glad that happened because that really made me see him for who he is instead of who i wanted him to be and when she said that like it brought tears to my eyes that she could have i mean talk about unconditional love that you can still truly love somebody and i'm not saying that you need there's a difference between somebody who is like you know cheating on you 10 times and that yeah yeah that, then it's a bit of a but, problem but yeah. but yeah so i think that's something i found and i will say this just being a couples therapist um for couples that are listening that are that the biggest problem with people going to couples therapy is that they often go when it's too late Mm-hmm. So I will tell you, anybody who's thinking about if you're in a relationship right now and you're – even if you're not necessarily having problems and you just want to – like I have a friend um, who does a podcast, the Social Work Podcast, and he and his wife, they go to therapy, and they're not even in like a bad time. He's like, I just want our therapist to know what it, our relationship looks like when things are going great. So that way when it's not going great, we kind of just check in, and then we know that, that – um, that, that, that she can have a kind of an idea of where we are. And it, it's a little bit of that where people, you know, I've had most of the couples, I would say honestly, like 75% that come to me, they've already broken up and they've already done. They really just want to come to me because one of them or both of them want me to tell them that that person was right. Mm. So that's a, that's a big tip that I can give. If you are in that, seek it out sooner than later. Don't wait too late for that. No, I'm interested. The people, the couples specifically that came to you that were already broken up, what percentage would you say? Just generally, I know it's kind of difficult to, mm-hmm. to nail down 15.32% um, ended up getting back together. That's actually the exact amount I was thinking. <laughs> I am a genius. <laughs> Bow to me. <laughs> you are. You are. No, I would say honestly about about 15 to 20%. I, oh, I, probably, hey, I was actually pretty accurate. Yeah, yeah you were. <laughs> End up staying together. There's probably a more realistic um, statistic to give for that, mm. but not it's it's not it's not great because again, 
people come when it's so late in the game. Now, the good thing about that, which, you know, because I'm a narrative therapist, so we look at the life through kind of, we, I look at the life through a story metaphor a lot of times, and meaning so, uh, which is can be mind-blowing to some couples is that, you know, I talk about, we, we definitely try to look at the, the client, uh, meaning the client, the couple, as two individual people, and how, and the, their coupleness, their relationship is just an aspect of who they are. It's not their identity. That's big for a lot of people. And I will say not to, not to make overgeneralized, but in my space, especially that resonates, changes a lot for women. Cause I think a lot of women put their identity and self-worth as well. I am the wife of this man, or I'm the girlfriend of this woman and, or whatever. And they really put that is who they are. And so, and that, again, that can bring up codependency. That can bring up not feeling like you're um, achieving your own personal goals because it's all about him or all about her. Uh, there's a, a really wonderful couples therapist who wrote a book called The Passionate Marriage. Um, his last name is Schnarch. That's Schnarch. unfortunate. <laughs> it is. His name. But That's so snarchy. <laughs> so snarky, yeah. But he's kind of like one of the world's most premier couples therapists. And he um, talks about this thing called individuation in the relationship and how it is so important to have this, your individual goals, your individual growth, your individual things that make you happy that are just for you. Mm -hmm. and, and keeping those in the relationship and also keeping them separate at the same time. Um, but anyway, so – when we talk with narrative therapy, I think when I talk about their relationship is an aspect like we talk if we're talking to a story that, well, sometimes the character kind of the characters of anger or fear or doubt or loneliness often write stories of our chapters of our life. And it's not necessarily the story we want to write. So what about what about either hope? Or what about connection? Or what about, you know, what are other kind of characters in our lives that bring um, a complexity to our story where it's not bad or good? Because, again, I think a lot of people do that with a relationship. It's that it's that somebody's bad or good. It's not. It's all gray. Yeah, I really like the idea, <laughs> the schnarchy idea, with the, uh, basically having something individual to you because I feel like – the codependency happens in a lot of relationships where you, your identity essentially becomes, like you said, this person, right? Yeah. You, you are this person's husband. You are this person's mm -hmm. wife, you, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think a lot of people, we live in a busy day and age, right? How – a couple questions here. How does sure. someone have something uh, – I'm thinking of actually my wife, for example um, – she is – we have a one-year-old daughter, and her identity is this daughter, and she watches mm -hmm. our daughter most of the day. I work most of the day. Um, how could she find the time to have something maybe individualized for her? Because I, I think like time is kind of a difficult – thing especially when you're busy all the time she's running around the house you know i help i i do the best i can one mm -hmm. of us has to work i mean she helps mm -hmm. me work um how do you find time in today's day and age you know it's you hit on i think the most personal and hardest relationship especially for women um for some men too that you know uh, i i know a, couple, a lot of single dads actually several single dads but it is being a parent, especially I think let's just kind of say that not to generalize, but I think there are some truth and some generalizations that that is true that women, especially moms, because are wrap a lot of their identity up in being a mom. And I've gotten a lot because with my podcast, my podcast is an advice podcast. So instead of like Dear Abby, that's why I call it Dear Maddie. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so a lot of people that write into my show that send me emails are – I mean, most of my listeners are moms. And so it is this, how do I tease out this identity, especially when you have a one-year-old? And I think a lot of it is um, recognizing that there is the want for you to have an individual individual need and also knowing that you don't have time for it. Mm -hmm. And but, but recognizing that there is the want. Like, so I would say like, look, let's say 
if your wife came to me and she was talking to me as a therapist or just whatever, I just came over to your house and we were having a glass of wine. <laughs> um, well, maybe she wasn't having wine. She's breastfeeding. But um, no, no, she she um, the breastfeeding's gone. Okay, so we're having wine, sugar. Yeah, wine and is so, wine is a plenty. Well, I might have a I might have a beer, but um, <laughs> but anyway, so and she said she's like I don't I don't have time for this, and I would just acknowledge the fact that she wants to have something of her own or to build some. I would just acknowledge how great that is because a lot of women, particularly, don't even have the idea to to be an indi- to individual in a relationship with their husband and with their children. It's all about, pardon me, all about them. And I think also though, it is sitting down with you and having a conversation of for her, yeah, it might not be a whole night or a whole day, but just even if it's, she says like, honey, I really, can you just watch the baby for two hours and I want to watch a movie that I love by myself or I want to, I want to like do a craft project or I want to like go work out or I want to, you know, watch a sports game. Even that, like, I say that I my friend uh, Don McCoy, who's a, a her website um, Donspiration dot com. She's really about women empowerment and and everything. And um, she always says to me that everybody needs a little win, and it's often those little wins that make us feel like we have a big win. And so for this, I would say it's like this: where's a little win where we could just grab a little bit of time, and it might only be like. 20 minutes Mm because that's all you have but where's the time where your husband or your somebody else in your life could do that and your wife's lucky that she has you because there's a lot of single parents you know that um i i can't i honestly i cannot i cannot even imagine being a single parent it it seems like the most difficult thing in the world to me but getting off topic here the reason i'm kind of hitting on this individualized thing is because Mm -hmm. applying it to a different thing here Someone going through a breakup who wants to get their ex back becomes a little mm-hmm. obsessive sometimes. Mm-hmm. They come, they, they become codependent on the relationship. And sometimes mm-hmm. really the best way for them to, A, get their ex back, B, move on from their ex, is to have these individual things that they do for themselves and not for their ex. So I think it's like a Amen. really important... Amen. Yeah, it's a really important thing that you bring up here. And it's something that... I find the people I've worked with struggle with the most because they want their ex back so much that they don't really understand that sometimes you have to do something for you as opposed to him or her to get them back. Or And a lot of people I work with, I'll tell them to do things, and a lot of it is the individualized things you're talking about here. And it's only after they do those things that they realize and they get the perspective that they don't want their ex back, especially when it's a really toxic thing. And it's difficult to get someone to go down that path I've found because when they're so stuck on their ex and they want to get their ex back and, and everything, it's difficult to say, Hey, step back, take some time for yourself. Don't think about him. Don't think about her. They kind of just nod their head and do the exact opposite. So, it's not just me saying it's Matt and uh, sh- what, what was it? Schnarky or sh- what? Schnarky. I'm literally, <laughs> I'm, I'm like for the, your listeners, I'm sitting here like bo- like a bobblehead. I'm agreeing with you so much because I've had so uh, honestly, I would say a lot, a majority of my individual clients, a lot of them come to me because of a breakup or because of um, or some like, and it's it's a little different, but even. Um, it's a little more probably extreme, but like I've had, you know, uh, several LGBT clients that come to me that have had kind of like the family breakup where they came out or something like, and their parents disowned them or something like that. But it still is that same adage of you can only devote so much energy to this relationship, whether it's your family member or a boyfriend or girlfriend until you have to, you have to cultivate your own happiness. And I tell people that now, if you cannot find a way to be happy now, you're not going to be happy later. And so, and I can say that to anybody. I've read, I forget the famous guy who wrote that book, who is Jewish and talked about being in the Holocaust, like being in like freaking Auschwitz and talking about finding happiness in Auschwitz. And I'm like, if this person who is a Jewish person being persecuted, who's in a concentration camp and they can find happiness yeah, and, that that and is, you're, and you're pissed off that you can't go right. to Taco Bell in a movie on Friday night with your boyfriend. 
Like, get out of yourself. But I agree with you. It's really, really hard to get people to get out of their head to just to to just to not be so focused. And a lot of that for me has been it's honestly it's sitting with them. And because I really believe the client is the expert of their life. So I'm the type of therapist. If you came to me, I'm not going to say, well, you have mommy issues, daddy issues, you're this, you're that. (laughs) That's more of an old school way of therapy, and that's great for some people, but I'm more of a postmodern therapist. We're more solution focused. So when people come in and they say, <clears throat> pardon me, they say, I want to talk about my problems, and we also say, as a postmodern therapist, I say, well, I want to talk about your solutions, and actually, I'll, I want to dissect what's going well in your life and kind of figure out what are the components of your strength, of any strengths or things that are going well, because then we can use those strengths to attack the problem. Which is helpful in this situation because a lot of people are focused on what they don't have from that other person. Exactly. So I actually will force them to try to, what like I guess to use a word, whether it's perspective or a lot of entrepreneurs say to pivot. I kind of force them to to look at things that are going well in their lives, even the fact of like what enabled them to make a decision. To come to therapy was it for themselves or was it for the other person and try to tease that out and if they're even if they're like for some people oddly enough i've had i remember one client who came to me who didn't like his day job but he was really good at it and it was actually fleshing out that he was he had he brought a lot of strengths to this job he didn't care for and he realized that one of the reasons he didn't like this job so much is that he was going to work just focused on the boyfriend that had just broke up and with him six mm-hmm. months before. It was totally like it was the rose colored. He he said an sh word, but he called <laughs> them like he called them that like colored glasses. That's what he when he realized he was wearing these glasses and kind of taking them to work and in other spe- aspects of his life and kind of not seeing what he was bringing to the table for other people. And so that was a very, because it's all about validation. When we're broken up with somebody, there's this feeling where we don't feel validated as a person. So instead of seeking that in someone else, I'm getting them to try, where are we finding validation in other parts of your life? So if it's not in this relationship, and I, I say this to your listeners, if you're wanting somebody back right now, what is it about that relationship that makes you feel like you are worthy to be on this planet, that you are that you are a person of value. Whatever that is, I just want to challenge you. Are there other aspects of your life that you've either gotten that before or that you are getting now? And look at those and and give weight to those because sometimes we poo-poo those things and say they're not that important when really it's kind of huge that you can show up to work and be a good employee or that you're a great daughter to your mom and you're able to like have a great relationship with her. Those are of value. Yeah, I think it completely ties into what you were saying before or what your colleague or friend said before about the small wins. It's essentially like you're looking at the small wins that you have already and using those to prop yourself up and maybe get some bigger wins. And someone going through a breakup, it's a really emotional time, but they've done studies and found that essentially the part of the brain that lights up, the part of the brain that becomes active when you go through a breakup is the same part of the brain that becomes active when a drug addict is going through withdrawal. Yeah. So your your body's all out of whack. You're doing all sorts of things. You're not really in your right mind. Sometimes it's focusing on the things you do have that can kind of give you some perspective. So great advice, Matt. Great advice. Well, thanks. That's why I'm working bow out. To you. Oh no, you've got it too. <laughs> uh, I'm just repeating what people told me. But that's why working out is so good if you're in a breakup. Because you, oh, you have no. I recommend that above all because it gets so. It is. And any time that I'm super stressed, it can almost compound when I do not work out. Yeah. Because working out really gets a lot of the energy out. It gets a lot of the stress out. It gets my mind off whole, things. If we're looking at a whole mind body and whether people know, you know, I believe in God and the soul and things like that. But so, and I believe that all energetically, not believe, I know scientifically it's proven that this is. When you work out, you're releasing the serotonin, you're releasing the endorphins, mm-hmm. and so that are counteracting a lot of of these components. I mean, there's there's a reason why. Think about a lot of people that you know that go through a divorce or a breakup that often do well at it, and and people a lot. If you think about how many of them actually started working out and getting in better shape, that most was, of that them was did. Yeah, it's like you go through the divorce and then all of a sudden 
20 pounds lighter. You know, yeah. it's, it's, and, it's, it's, a, it's really fascinating thing to see. And those are the people a lot of times that do very statistically it does those people do much better within their breakup. So, mm. and I, I sell that for anybody, whether somebody's coming for depression, I tell two things I recommend a lot working out. And then for somebody too, that's obsessed with somebody else right now in a breakup, I recommend volunteering. I think if you can have, even if it's an hour or two hours a week, seeing other people that, cause a lot of times you, that's why I love group therapy actually more than individual therapy. I love group therapy and things like that because People feel like they're alone. They feel like they're isolated by their problem. And then they see that other people either have similar problems and that feels normalized into them, or they see that other people are going through stuff and it kind of, it's like a, like a little slap to them of like a wake up slap of, <laughs> right. Oh, like I was saying, like we're stressed out about this, but you know, I remember going through my own problems and then, you know, I, I worked for, I, I ran a one of the things I ran was a crystal meth recovery group, and I've never been addicted to crystal meth or anything. Luckily, just Breaking Bad. That's all. Just yeah. I mean, I'm I'm, in, I'm addicted to maybe like chocolate, like Oreos. Like that's my addiction. Halloween but, just came up. Oh yeah, my god! I know. I can't. The shame I feel <laughs> yeah, what right. I hate right now. But so, but no, it's it definitely is. Um, if I, I I really try to just. Um, Oh, you said chocolate, and now I'm gay ADD, and now I forgot what I was saying. It's all good, man. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. Group therapy, you were talking Gr- oh, about. Oh, yeah. That's huge. If you can volunteer, that's just – it's such a beautiful thing. A, you're giving yourself, but it really is – like uh, being of service in some way is never going to it, – it, it, that's going to help your valid, your own self-validation as well and kind of get you out of your – what I say to clients, I say you need to get out of your story. You're so wrapped up in this story of yeah. being – we right. let's get you out of the story. So let's introduce a new character. So let's volunteer. And but I always have to say, let's not introduce a new character of a new boyfriend or a new girlfriend. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's your story, not the yeah. Yeah, and I also kind of wanted to touch a little bit on the the working out thing because I recommend that to I really highly recommend that to everyone that I yeah. basically have given advice to. Um, but every once in a while, I try. Th- Dealing with someone who's going through a breakup, they don't, they don't, aren't always in their right mind, and everything they do is to get their ex back, especially yes. the people who come to my website, and that's not always the best. And I've researched; I know exactly what it takes to work. There's no guarantees, obviously, but working out is an essential part of the breakup process and and handling it correctly. But the way I have to sell it to people is you'll look good, you'll feel good, but every once in a while I'll get that woman who comes in and starts cracking the whip on me saying something like, oh, you're just one of those guys who's fat shaming or doing something like that, but it's not anything like that at all. There are physical benefits to doing this. And yes, obviously you'll look better, and if you're a little overweight, you're going to look better then. You'll feel better about yourself. But this it's not like we're fat shaming anyone doing this, you know? Look, if you think that we're fat shaming you right now, cancel our subscription because we don't need your issues. Exactly. All right? So, I mean, I think it's – that's that's their stuff. And I I think that, that, that that's just somebody else. The, when somebody's coming to you like that and I've had – whether it's about saying you're fat shaming, they're basically, they're already self-defeating the solution. And that, that just, which to me, I don't get angry about that. I don't take that personal. I just go, oh, you're not ready to move on yet. Mm -hmm. You're just not ready to find healing yet. So you need to stew in this. And some people stew in those kind of things for years. And then other people, they finally move on, and yeah, you know, like it's the whole drawing the horse to water thing. You can't, yeah, you can't, can't do make that. A drink. Can't make you a drink. You can't. All right, Matt. So where can people find you? Obviously, oh, that's you're, it. you're this was quick. <laughs> um, yeah, they can find me. Hey, listen to the podcast and um, the Dear Maddie Show dot com. You can find it on iTunes or Stitcher, and it's M A T T I E Maddie. So Dear Maddie Show dot com, um, and that's yeah, that's my website too. Dear Maddie Show dot com. You can write in questions. Um, you can I do. see his uh, commercial reels too. Too, it's like f- all of the commercials he's been in, and he's been in some huge commercials. Like, blew me away when I saw it. I was like, I've seen that commercial, especially the one with the uh, Captain Obvious. You know, you yeah, get locked right. out of your room. 
<laughs> but that also encourages you to work out when you're when you play a character that they fucked out of the room. Ah, and yes. <laughs> and um, that, and then you go to, like to a movie and they show that like I'm going to see the Avengers and then all of a sudden I see my like jiggly butt and like sixty. And feet, everyone and like, saw the Avengers too. You so you know yeah, it's like everybody. played around the entire. <laughs> oh yeah, I would be I I would be walking down the street and people would go, "It's Wednesday, Gary," and I'm like, Jeez. but um yeah, so definitely. Uh, that would, that, but yeah, you can see all that. And then, because I also, I have a YouTube channel, but again, this is all on my website, dearmatishow.com. But I do, I answer Dear Maddie questions on YouTube as well. Um, I do also do like some recaps of some shows. Um, what shows are you good. watching lately? Well, it's a terrible show. It's terrible. Speaking of breakup, it's called Finding Prince Charming. And it's like the new gay bachelor <laughs> show on logo. It's, it's a hot mess. It's the worst show, but I recap it with my friend. And um, we have a good time. I will say, uh, Chris, that if, for your listeners, that my show, I'm also a stand-up comedian, so there's a little bit of language on my show. It's all so, good. It's all good. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, DearMatticShow.com is where people can find all that kind of stuff and listen to the podcast and all that good stuff. All right. Thanks for visiting. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciated it. Bye-bye.